I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the water. Returning, if you will, to Jeremiah, the eighth chapter. Again, that is Jeremiah, chapter eight. Verse number 8 of Jeremiah chapter 8, the Bible says, How do you say we are the wise and the Lord and the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. Verse 9 says, The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. I want to look for a subject this morning simply, where is their wisdom? Again, where is their wisdom? Just reading Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse number 9, verse number nine my mind immediately a key in on the phrase that ends that verse. They have rejected the word of the Lord. What wisdom is in them? When an individual rejects the teachings of Jesus, when an individual rejects the hearing of the gospel, what wisdom is in them? When God has given us a word whereby we can govern our lives and we can live according to his, uh, his will, if an individual sees that and they reject that, what wisdom is in them? The context of the book of Jeremiah, of course we know Jeremiah is often known as the weeping prophet. Uh, the book of Lamentation also is a book uh, that he wrote along with his, uh, the book he uh, called after himself, that being Jeremiah. Uh, and of course, Jeremiah here is a contemporary with that of Ezekiel. If you remember in around 722 B.C., God's people, uh, that being the kingdom of Judah, had went into Assyrian captivity. And the Bible lets us know how Assyrian had came to the, uh, the power of their day. And so now you have Babylon coming into the scene, and Babylon is going to crush Assyrian, and they're going to take all of those slaves that were in Assyria, and they're going to just bring them all down to Babylon. And of course, Ezekiel and also Jeremiah and Daniel as well are going to be the contemporaries or the prophets that were brought to Babylon during this time in their history. Uh, Jeremiah was a very straightforward individual. Uh, Jeremiah really just wanted his people to repent and to turn to God. Uh, for so many years, God had instructed them that if you repent and turn from your ways, then I'll save you. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. If you repent and if you do what I have to say, I'll save you from where you are. But the Bible over and over again in this book just lets us know how uh, they had a pattern for wanting to do wrong by God. Uh, you may say to yourself this morning, well, Josh, that doesn't, make, that, 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 that doesn't make any sense in my mind, and I would agree with you. Why would an individual not want to listen to God? Why would an individual continue to go down this pattern of sin that is going to lead them further and further away from God? It doesn't make any sense, but yet we do it all the time. We know what the Bible has to say concerning our salvation. If you look at it from one perspective, those who are not members of the body of Christ, we can look at it from their perspective as well. Why would an individual reject, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized when ultimately this is something that is for, for the betterment of your own life? But if you look at it from the side of a child of God, why would a child of God reject God's teachings? Why would a child of God reject what the Bible has to say concerning their salvation? If you go back to Jeremiah 6 and verse number 10, again, Jeremiah throughout this book is going to give us a different verses that is going to attest to their rejection to God's word. The Bible says in Jeremiah 6 and verse number 10, to whom shall I speak? 
and give warning that they may hear. Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in this. That particular verse reminds me of what the exact opposite, what the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 1. The psalmist says there, they delight in the Lord, and they do that both day and night. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, Nehemiah there says in those first eight verses how uh, those people came to him and said, preach unto us the word of God. Tell us what the Bible has to say. Tell us what God wants us to do. Tell us how God will have us to be saved. And the Bible says, from morning until midday until night, Jeremiah, uh, Nehemiah, that is, just preached unto them the word of the Lord. And Jeremiah says in verse number 15, Jeremiah again asks, were they ashamed when they committed abominations before the Lord? Nay, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that time they shall cast down, said the Lord. Verse 16 says, Thus said the Lord, Stand ye in the way and see. And as for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your soul. But the Bible says, But they said, We will not walk therein. Why would an individual not walk where Jesus wants him to walk? Why would an individual decide to themselves, well, I think I could do a much better job at Jesus in trying to navigate my own way through life? If you look at Jeremiah 7 and verse number 2, the Bible says, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, and enter into the gates to worship the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways, your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. It's almost as if, and I hate to be uh, exaggerating this morning, but it's almost as if God is on his knees begging for his children to just do the right thing. Here I am here on my knees. I'm pleading with you and I'm begging with you. You don't have to go that way. You don't have to go all the way down there. All you have to do is turn around and come back to me. What well, the Bible says, they said to themselves, we will not walk therein. If you key in on verse number 13 of that chapter, Jeremiah 7, the Bible says, and now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, and I called you, but you answer not. When you look at the 15 references in the Old Testament in terms of God's people explicitly rejecting God, five out of those 15 times, Jeremiah here is pleading with them, come back to God. Where are you going? Come back to God. You don't have to go down that way. Come back to God. Look at verse number 16. Therefore pray now thou for this people. Neither lift up cry nor prayer for them. Neither make intercession to them. For I will not hear thee. What a sad reality it is when even God won't talk back to you. You know, I think sometimes in life we, you know, we kind of break relationships with people. And, and sometimes people get mad at us and we say to ourselves, we know that person won't talk to me. And, you know, for the most part, we can live with those things. Though it's not good, we can get up in the next day and live with those things. But how sad it is when you're crying out to the God of heaven and God won't even answer you back. How sad it is sometimes, say we use our spiritual cell phones and we try to call God. We're trying to reach out to him, but there's no answer. But again, for these first six chapters in all of the book of Isaiah, God has been crying out to them. If you turn and if you come back to me, then I'll hear you. When you look at in Malachi, the end of that chapter, going on to the New Testament, and, and, and history lets us know how uh, there was some 550 years of silence there from God. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12, there's a famine in the land, not of bread nor of thirst of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. For 500 years, they were not going to receive a prophecy or a word from God. And it's simply because they rejected God. Verse 23 says, But this thing commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. 
and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with thee. No doubt, Jeremiah felt the impact of his people not obeying God. Again, he's identified as the weeping prophet. He's not weeping over the fact of his own life. He's weeping over the fact that God has begged his people to come back and they simply refuse to obey God. What else can a man do but cry out to God? What else can a man do but pour his heart out to God? God, I don't know what else to do. I don't know how to help them. If you remember in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse number 8, again, the Bible there says they rejected God's word. In Jeremiah 20 and verse number 9, the Bible says, Jeremiah says, I would not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah more or less said, I'm done with this. God, here you have called me to preach. Here you have called me to talk to these people, but they won't listen. But Jeremiah said, I had a burning fire in my heart that I could not contain. Every day we try to talk to people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And more often than not, they reject the teachings God has to say. And I'm sure, no doubt, especially if you know this person really, really close, and this is a loved one or a family member, it has almost moved us to tears sometimes because we are trying to tell this person what they have to do to be saved, and they simply don't want to hear it. They continue to reject the teachings of Jesus. What else could Jeremiah do but to cry out to God? In Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 24, the Bible there says, but they hearken not. So you mean to tell me after verse 16, after God tells them, I won't hear them anymore. The Bible says in verse 24, they still hearken not, nor incline their ears, but walk in the counsels and in the imaginations of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Where are they going if they go backwards? I mean, really, when you look at God's people history and when you look at them being slaves in Egypt, when you look at them wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, when you look at the period of the judges, the period of the kings, the periods of the prophets, where are they going to go? You would think by now they would have it in their minds. It's time for us to go to God. You know, at least if I lean forward, at least I can see where I'm going. But these people are continually trying to go backwards. The book of Hebrews carries that entire thing. The Hebrews writer here is writing to these Hebrew Christians, encouraging them not to go back. Encouraging them to not go back to Judaism. But they didn't want to listen. The Bible says in verse 26, Yet they hearken not unto me, nor incline their ears, but harden their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Jeremiah is in a difficult position because Jeremiah is the one God called to tell them the truth. And if you have ever been on side, if, if you have ever been on the side of truth and you're trying to tell someone who's in wrong about the truth, it's more or less people are going to not only reject the truth, but they're going to reject you for telling them the truth. Why did they kill Stephen? Because he told them the truth. Why did they kill Jesus? Because they told, because he told them the truth. Why did they kill the Apostle Paul? Because he told them the truth. The only thing that can save an individual from their sins is the truth. Yes. Why, is, why are God's people constantly rejecting the truth? Why are God's people hearing what Jeremiah has to say? And they're not only rejecting Jeremiah, but they are rejecting God. Why are they rejecting that? Because the truth is so hard to hear. And when you look in the Bible, when you look into the word of God, it's going to show you the truth. If you want someone to lie to you, don't read the Bible. Because the Bible is a book that is going to tell you the truth. If you have a problem in your life, 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. That verse is in the Bible for a reason. If we look at the Bible, the Bible is going to tell us the truth. These people hated Jeremiah because he told them the truth. But if you look at Jeremiah 8 and verse number 9, our text for this morning, Jeremiah says the wise men are ashamed. Now, let's pause and let's ponder that phrase for a moment. Jeremiah says the wise men are ashamed. Now, if they really are wise, what will they do? They'll listen to the truth. He says the wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. They now become slaves in a land that is not their own, Psalm 137. They have rejected the word of the Lord. What wisdom is in them? How does this apply to us today? Two quick points. Number one, those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. What wisdom is in them? Now, I'm not talking about when you're having a Bible study with someone for the first time. Because truth be told, when we all heard what the Bible says concerning our salvation for the first time, nine times out of ten, we don't always believe it. You mean to tell me the Bible says this about the church of our Lord? You mean the Bible tells me I have to be baptized in order to be saved? And more often than not, people don't believe that the very first time you show them. But there are people who have heard enough gospel truth to save the entire world, yet they still have not obeyed that gospel. When you look at Romans chapter 1, Paul audience the Gentiles chapter 2, the Jews, he wrote to them for that specific reason. Here are the Jews thinking to themselves, we are so much better than those nasty, ugly, unclean Gentiles. When they themselves fail to realize that if you look at the truth, you come to realize you are just as bad, if not worse, than the Gentiles. Paul's conclusion, all y'all have seen. Romans 3, it comes short of the glory of God. The Bible says we must hear, believe, and repent, confess, to be baptized, to be saved from our sins. An individual who rejects that is not wise. But when you look at it from the other side, point number two, those who reject the word of the Lord, those who have already been saved, those who have already put Christ on in baptism, sometimes we still reject the truth. Sometimes we still reject what the Bible says concerning how we should live our lives. Well, how do you know that? When you look at the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 1, Titus says, For but speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. Then Titus starts listing behavioral issues the churches were having. Paul, there is, right into Titus, started listing all the behavioral issues the church were having. When you look at God's people in the Old Testament, especially them coming out of Egypt, you don't think all of those people were perfect, do you? You have over a million people. Surely there were some alcoholics in that crowd. Surely there were some liars in that crowd. Surely there were some homosexuals, some fornicators. Surely there were all types of people in that crowd. When you look at the New Testament, you find the same thing as well. What am I trying to say? It doesn't matter what the sin is. If you are willing to obey the truth, that being Jesus, you can get out of that sin. When you are in a sin, whatever the sin is, I don't care what it is. One person may have a problem being an alcoholic. One person, they wake up and they lie all day. Whatever the sin is, you pick one. Whatever it is, you can overcome it with the truth. Christ spoke of himself. What is truth? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You don't have to wonder what truth is. You don't have to wonder what absolute authority or truth is. Jesus says, when you look at me, I am truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Then he says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through truth. Thy word is truth. John 8, verse 32, ye shall obey the truth. And the truth will set you free. Jeremiah said they have rejected the word of the Lord. What wisdom is in them? And as a result of them rejecting God's word, they went into Babylonian captivity. And there they were going to be for 70 years. Well, what if they went to Babylon and started repenting? That's good. 
but they still had to stay in Babylon. Well, what if they pleaded and did everything God told them to do? They still would have had to stay in Babylon. I'm trying to tell you this morning, church, we need to make sure we get it right with God before he sends us into our own spiritual Babylon. How, 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 how long is God going to keep me there? How long God is going to keep me here? I'm doing everything God wants me to do. I'm doing everything God asked me to do. But what about all those times you didn't do what God told you to do? The consequences we have to deal with, then we have to live through those things. But I don't think it's so much about the consequences. I don't. I don't believe God just wants us to feel bad all the time. It's so that we can get to a point where we are more dependent on God, where we are more dependent on truth than we are of our own limited wisdom. James says in James 1 verse 5, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. They rejected God's word. And as a result, there was no wisdom in them. But if you're flipping around again, how am I right before God? I do what he says. Is that simple? Absolutely. I do what he says concerning my salvation. I hear what he has to say concerning on how I need to be saved. I believe that. I have faith that whatever God says on any given subject, I have enough faith to say that is true. That is absolute. Why is that? Because the author himself is the definition of absolute truth. I humble myself and I say, I have sinned. I confess him as Lord and I'm baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. That's wisdom. Because I have seen what I have done as wrong and God shows me now what I have to do to be right by him. Psalm 14 verse 1, the psalmist said, the fool have said in his heart, there is no God. In Luke chapter 12, the man who was uh, more or less boasting of his own actions, I'll tear down my barns, I'll build bigger barns. He never got to do that. But on the other side, here I am a Christian. Here I am a child of God. I put him on in baptism. I've already done all the steps of salvation. Now, the work begins. I study his word, and that's how I become wise. Of course, we have to live, and of course, we have to experience different things. It just comes with age. For the most part, I have the blueprints on how to live a God-fearing, faithful life. And it's in this book. We encourage you this morning, if you need to come, please come while we stand and sing. I heard an old, old story of how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. Thank you.